Welcome to Wealthion. I'm Wealthion founder Adam Taggart, welcoming you back for another weekly market recap here at the end of a week uh, with a very busy news cycle. Um, as usual, I've got my great friend, portfolio manager, Lance Roberts here with me. Hey, Lance, buddy, how you doing? I'm doing good. It's uh, the, It was a holiday short week, so it went by fast. Yeah. And, you know, for a guy who'd been on vacation, uh, you actually look pretty rested here this time. Yeah, no, exactly. So, yeah, it, it was, uh, plans didn't work out the way we expected, but hey, it's all fine. OK. OK. Well, glad to hear the staycation uh, oh, yeah, did its yeah. trick. No, it's all good. Um, all right. We got a lot to talk about. Um, it's another U-shaped week in the markets, right? Where they're, they're finishing up roughly where they started, uh, had a big dip in the week. Um thing that recovered the market this week uh, is the news about the debt ceiling uh, agreement uh, that appears to have been reached here. Um, I want to dive as deeply as we can into what's in that act. I've got a list here I'll walk through with you, but just quickly in terms of market action for the week, anything truly notable to share here? Um, we did more than just do a bit of a U-turn. Uh, we broke out on Friday uh, pretty strongly to a new high from the October lows. We broke above that 4,200 level of resistance fairly strongly. Um, that now sets us up for a run to 4,306 is going to be out of that next level. Now, that's going to be the, the peak of where we get back to those August highs of 2022. Uh, you get above those August highs, there's really not much stopping you back to all-time highs. So, you know, as we talked about before, this market just remains in a very bullish pattern. Um, in fact, if you let me, if you'll let me share a screen real quick, we can just do a quick kind of a technical overview if you if you're interested. All right, go ahead. So, just you know, just in, you know, just so people kind of put some of this stuff into context. So, um, so this is uh, basically kind of where we are. You can see that you know. Back from these uh, these bear market lows that we had back in October, uh, there was kind of a, a double bottom that we were kind of setting in. And if you kind of zoom into that spot, there's actually an inverse head and shoulders that formed right there at those October lows. And since then, we've been running along uh, these kind of running bullish trends in the markets. And again, every time we come back down and test those levels, um, those have been a good buying opportunity to put capital to work. Markets keep breaking above new highs, uh, breaking out above resistance. And we just did that on Friday. So following that employment report on Friday, which I thought was interesting because a really strong employment report should really not be good for markets because that means the Fed's not going to cut rates anytime soon. Right. On the other side of it, it, it says the economy, there, there's no recession, right? There's, there's no recession concern in the economy right now. Employment is fine. Wages are growing. So nothing, there's nothing for that, uh, kind of that concern. So there's so much money that's now been set up in money market funds and treasury bills of people worrying about a recession. Now all that money's getting drug back into the market. So this keeps propelling the market higher every time we get this kind of economic news, even though that works against the Fed, right? So higher stock markets are basically not Fed friendly because that eases monetary conditions, exactly the opposite of what the Fed wants to do. So the Fed's got a real problem here, but technically we're back on a buy signal. We had a, a bit of a, a sell signal and that's this kind of bottom phase of the chart here. We had a sell signal that kind of triggered back earlier in, in, in kind of that March, April timeframe. And the market kind of just traded sideways for about 45 days. Uh, we've now, con that consolidation, that work off of that sell signal has now been reversed. Market's back on a buy signal. So really, what looks like we're going to try to run up to 43, 4,400 will be the next stop. Okay. Um, so you published a piece this week um, titled Technical Review of the Market, Bulls in Control. You've just talked about that here. Yep. In the piece, you did say bulls in control but resistance ahead. Um, I'm curious, uh, are your concerns about that resistance, are they impacted at all by uh, today's breakout, by Friday's uh, breakout? Uh, no, the, what I was talking about in that article is, is I'm talking about specifically this resistance right here, which is these, these August highs. Um, it's also a function of the Fibonacci retracement. Um, and so I know that's a bunch of funky, uh, you know, kind of <laughs> technical mumbo jumbo, but if we look at a, an actual Fibonacci chart, so Fibonacci is just mathematical calculations of, and, and the, the, it's called the golden ratio. And if you look through 
everything in the world. Uh, you see the, the this kind of this mathematical formula pop up the 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 the, the, the circles in a conch shell to the the sunflower seeds to the distance between your elbow and your and your tip of your fingers. Um, <laughs> this mathematical formula just shows up everywhere. It's just one of those those mathematical um, you know consistencies that occurs all throughout nature. Well, it also applies to stock markets as well. And what stock markets tend to do is they have a specific kind of pattern. And when they break down, and so we can kind of measure the decline of the market from the January 2022 peaks to the October lows. And from that low, we should have a retracement. And at some point we will get, you know, at some point in the future, right, wherever that is, we will break out to all time highs again, right? So that will be a 100% retracement ultimately of that decline. But the mathematical ratios are 23.6%. So once we got, that's this little red area at the bottom of the chart. So that first rally was 23.6%. The green area there is the 50% retracement. Now, this is an important level. Historically, and this isn't always the case, there's, there's sometimes that this, this fails, but more often than not, when the market recovers 50% of its previous loss, the bear market, that, that correctional process is over. Um, mm -hmm. And generally from there, the markets go on to retrace fully that previous decline. So we've completed that 50% retracement. The next level is the 61.8% retracement level. That Once we get to that level and, and can break above that level, that'll take out that August high as well. That pretty much sets the markets to, to go ahead and complete the rest of that retracement all the way back to, to previous highs. Now, it doesn't mean it's going to happen immediately. doesn't mean you can't have a correction in the process where the market pulls back a bit. We're direly in need of a 5 to 10% correction in the markets just from a technical uh, standpoint. Markets are very overbought here. Um, they're stretched. If you take a look at the NASDAQ as a good example, it's trading above 70% on the RSI index. That's a very overbought level. So we do need a bit of a correction, but for right now, the bullish trend's in place. So corrections back to kind of this rising trend line that we've been building from the October lows is a good buying opportunity to put capital to work. Okay. Um, and if you if you were to see a, a, a retracement that actually punctured below that that rising trend line, would that be a sign that that momentum actually it's may changed. be shifting from bullish to bearish? No, no, that won't be a maybe it has shifted. It will be, it has shifted. Okay. Uh, so, well, well, but it would have to may, close down there for some period of time, right? You, yeah. You, yeah. Well, what, what technically what you'd want to see, so if you really want to just get all technical about it, um, you break this rising trend line, you come up, retest it, and then fail. Um, if you do that, you've now broken that rising trend and you're now starting potentially a new trend lower. So that would suggest that the bull market rally that, that started in October is over and you're probably going to retest some lower level. So potentially start coming back and talking about the December lows, maybe the, the kind of those uh, July, September, October lows, uh, potentially uh, during that correctional process. But, you know, if that happens, we've got other stuff going on in the economy that we need to be worrying about as well. Yeah. OK. And just just to um, put a last word on these Fibonacci levels, uh, these basically show why you were pulling the numbers you were mentioning earlier, right, the 4306 is the next major Fibonacci level. And then you can see there's a lot of blank space there up until 4535, right? So if we if we were to break above that 4306 decisively, you got that pull of that that next Fibonacci level up there, you know, whatever right. 200 S P points higher, right? Yeah. Well let me let me correct one thing here. So this this 4306 level is this July, is this August 12th high. It's also the October 21st of 2021 low. So that's this resistance level here. Right above that at 42.32, so just 18 points higher, is the 61.8% retracement level. So you're, you're technically correct. I mean, but there's two uh, very important resistance level kind of clustered right there. And that's what I was talking about in that, in, in that article on the website, is that next resistance level is this cluster of those August highs, that previous October low, and that Fibonacci retracement level all sitting right there very close together. Okay, um, I'm going to ask you more about the bullish side again for a second. Um, <clears throat> but uh, we've had a lot that's been very market positive recently, um, and of course, the past 24 hours has been the potential resolution of of the debt ceiling drama, right? Which you know, markets hate uncertainty. 
They love certainty. Obviously, you know, markets were beginning to get a little bit worried that, hey, this thing could really get protracted. And we had all these dire, you know, Armageddon-like headlines of what would happen if the U.S. defaulted. That's now being taken off the table. So um, obviously, markets are jumping on that. Um, but they've had a big run. That news is now out. Um, who knows if there are any other major big catalysts around here, but, but if I heard you correctly, it sounds like, especially looking at <clears throat> technical indicators like <clears throat> the RSI, you're saying, look, things are looking overstretched here right now. Um, and, a, and a pullback, you know, is not unlikely here. And as you said, the market probably even to continue higher, a five or 10% retracement would probably be a healthy thing to help it get there. Right. And it did. Let me, let me uh, just, Share one more time. I was I thought we were done, but I guess we're not. <laughs> <laughs> um, so so yeah, you know. First of all, you know, just to be clear, you know, this market never really worried about the debt ceiling. You know, you and I were have been talking about the last four weeks. You know, stop worrying about the debt ceiling. It's not an issue. You know, we were talking about the one month, three month Treasury yield. Everybody was freaking out because there was a deviation. I was like, it doesn't mean anything. Don't worry about it. The debt ceiling is going to get resolved. Um, and, and that's always been the case. And, you know, the difference was if you go back to 2011, during the whole middle of the debt ceiling default issue, the market declined 20 percent before we got a debt ceiling resolution done. Market never even blinked this time around. We kind of flopped around a little bit for a, for a month or so. But the market was never worried about the debt ceiling deal. They've got the market's gotten very complacent. I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. It's it's certainly not good, you know, from a you know, managing our debt standpoint by any stretch of the imagination, but the markets are, are very complacent uh, with these debt ceilings now that they're going to get passed. We always pass them. Nobody's got the fortitude or the cojones in Washington to actually cut spending. And some of the comments that were made by McCarthy and others on, on the debt ceiling deal are absolutely just ridiculous. Um, but that, again, another conversation we can have another day. No, but, no, we're going to have it today. We're going to get there in a few minutes. <laughs> but, but importantly, you know, when we take a look at the market, so you, you know, this is just a so another measure of the markets is we were just talking about Fibonacci. We're going to get all technical today. This is going to be technical Mojo Friday. Um, but <laughs> um, there's another measure called Bollinger Band. And you can put these on kind of any chart that you want. Um, and, and what it measures is, is standard deviation. And, you know, and to, to, without getting really complicated, you know, there's, there's, it's basically, if you think about stretching a rubber band, I can only stretch a rubber band so far before it either, I can't stretch it any further or it just simply breaks. So in order for me to stretch the rubber band again, I have to relax it first and then I can stretch it again. So if I want to stretch that rubber band, I've got to relax it, then I can stretch it again. And so what Bollinger Bands measure is two standard deviations, three standard deviations, four standard deviations away from a moving average. Uh, so if you think about a moving average, stock prices have to trade above and below that price, the average price, for there to be an average, right? If, if it's an average, it's both prices above and below that level. That's what creates the average. So if I can, if I measure stock prices as a deviation from that moving average, it can tell me when prices have kind of gone too far in the short term. And, and right now on Friday, markets are now trading three standard deviations into uh, so on Friday, the market traded three standard deviations above its 50-day moving average. Now, historically, markets can't trade that deviated away from the moving average for very long before you get a correction. So again, you know, this is just kind of one of those indicators that suggests the market's kind of moved too far too fast here. We need a bit of a pullback, you know, towards that 50-day moving average. And that's a very common occurrence. So, you know, when you when you when you know we when we're talking here in the next week or two or three weeks, it's like, hey, the market corrected two or three percent over the last couple of weeks. Very normal. In any given year, you should expect a five to ten percent correction in the market. That's just normal functions of the market. That's healthy uh, for the market to act that way. So again, you know, there's short term, we're overbought on stochastics, we're overbought on the on the will on the uh, uh, relative strength index. We're trading above 70 there as well. So again, the markets have just gone very far here. We need a bit of a pullback and that'll give you a better opportunity. So if you just be a little patient here, uh, wait for a pullback if you want to add some exposure to the market. 
Okay. And I want to stay on the bull side just a little bit because uh, I've been getting a lot of comments from folks saying, hey, you know, you got all these people on and they're saying really negative things about the macro environment, but but the market, right? Yeah. Uh, and I, I want to, I'm going to be very sensitive to the fact that, look, the market's going to do what the market's going to do. And it doesn't matter what the, my opinion, your opinion, the opinion of anybody I bring in the program here. You know, if you're looking to make money in the markets, we got to be honest about what's happening in the markets here. Um, so, uh, you know, clearly uh, the whole AI uh, party that's raging in the markets is continuing right now. So that's that's still going on. I think as as long as you know sentiment is is super optimistic in that space, more money is going to flow into that space. Um, uh, the question I'm going to ask you is: Is are you seeing any any uh, uh, changes in momentum there either you know an increasing amount of money coming in to chase that or, or money beginning to trickle yeah. out um what, what what are you seeing no no absolutely it's it's there it, basically retail investors woke up over the last two weeks and there's been a tremendous inflow into technology stocks in general um in particular retail investors are now starting to pile into you know nvidia and you know amd and palantir and 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 uh ai uh, there's a company called a the stock symbol is actually ai it's cai is the, the company it had a big crash last week but you know companies are you know these these retail investors are like oh I, I'm, I'm missing the chase so very much like we saw with the meme stocks with gamestop and amc and others we're now seeing them do exactly that same type of performance with these AI stocks. And, and again, this weekend's newsletter. So if you go to our website, shameless plug, and subscribe at realinvestmentadvice.com for our weekend newsletter, I'm actually going through the similarities between the AI chase and what you and I witnessed back in 1999 during the dot com bubble. A lot of the same sentiment, a lot of the same attitudes of you know, people and, and thoughts. You know, the, the internet's going to change the world. It did, right? And no doubt the internet changed the world. Look what we're doing right now, right? You couldn't do that in the 90s. Um, but the 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 evolution of the revenues and the profitability never came, and it didn't support all these lofty aspirations of companies that were back then. I mean, it's a good example: uh, Cisco Systems, uh, the networking company. It was the Nvidia darling of 1999, 2000. And if you bought Cisco Systems in 1999 and forgot to sell it, you're still not back to even you know, 24 years later. So, you know, we're seeing exactly the same type of attitude with NVIDIA, which great company, right? Fantastic company. Um, to buy one of their GPUs for AI costs like a quarter million dollars. How many companies are going to be able to afford that kind of outlay for those type of GPUs? Yes, some companies will do that for sure, but there's going to be two things that have to happen. Ultimately, either that price that GPU has to come down dramatically, which means less revenues, less profit margins, or the, the development of AI as, as, as its entirety. And everybody thinks this is going to be in everything that we touch, smell, feel, smoke, you know, eat, whatever, <laughs> that artificial intelligence will be involved, doesn't actually come to you know, the full fruition. So in other words, expectations are lofty. And that's what sets up some of the problem potentially down the road because valuations ultimately will matter. And some of the valuations getting priced in these stocks are simply just, just will never be met. That doesn't mean, though, that the insanity can't run. And, you know, we, we see NVIDIA go from 300 to 500 before this bubble's over. It can certainly happen and you can't discount that. Okay, great. And and um, I'm trying to stay on the bullish train here before hopping yeah. off. And of course, you know, big part of me wants to point out to folks that uh, <laughs> the, the retail jumping in tends to be a classic late stage sign, right? Mm -hmm. um, and that to the extent that this may be an asset price bubble, these are the bag holders that are that are jumping in here and, and likely paying the highest rates before everything corrects. But to your point, and, and you've made this point several times, uh, right at the beginning of this latest, uh, you know, uh, I'm going to call it a mania in the markets, um, is that, you know, this stuff can go faster and higher than than most people expect. That's what we have seen from the previous bubbles. And you've had that chart you put up on the screen showing right. showing them all. Um, so point being is, is um, you know, don't, ex don't place big bets on it ending anytime soon. It could for sure. Um, but, uh, you know, especially if you take a short position, you know, yeah. you can just get your face melted off. Right. And so it, it, the key point I'm trying to score here is that, that 
increasing inflows into this market are supportive in the short term, at least, of, of higher prices from here. Yeah, um, no, the, I, you, you're, you're, I was just say no. You're, you're absolutely right. I mean, you, you do not short this type of a market. Um, this is a very dangerous market to be short. Um, but on the other hand, you know, you also want to buy it because prices are going higher. But importantly, just don't forget to sell. And that was my point about Cisco. None of this is bearish, right? This is just the mania phase that we're in. And they can, like you said, it can go a lot longer and last a lot longer than logic would, would, would rationally expect. The problem that investors run into is they forget to sell. They get greedy, right? And, and so, you know, just, it's, it's uh, you know, wait for a pullback in some of these stocks. You're going to get a pullback. It may not be this week, might not be this month. But at some point, you're going to get a pullback in the next several months, which will give you an opportunity you know, to buy into some of these stocks that you want to own. But then the, the other side of that is don't forget to sell them and take some profits down the road. Yeah. And in the case of the, the, the AI related stocks, um, uh, you know, yes, don't forget to sell. But that that's like giving people the advice, buy low, sell high. It's like, yeah, well, of course. Thanks, buddy. Right. Like I didn't already know that. Right. And so what I would say is if you don't if you're, do it. Yeah. <laughs> Well, but if if you're trying to play an exponential run up like what we're seeing right now, right? Um, my here's my advice: you correct any way you like. Um, I would say you have to determine your sell parameters when you buy, right? And then say, look, you know, no matter how I feel <laughs> once these parameters get triggered, I'm going to sell. I'm gonna I'm gonna commit to the discipline that you know I put in a trailing stop, and that trailing stop gets hit. I don't care how you know, euphoric the headlines might be at the time and how much I want to change my mind, I'm going to sell, right? Uh, because what happens is, is people fall in, into the siren song or the market corrects so quickly that they're like, oh gosh, well now it's below my, my the sell price I said, well, I'm going to hold on until it gets back, right? And then you end up riding the whole thing down. So you're nodding as I'm saying all this, but correct correct that statement in any way you like. Uh, no, you're absolutely right. You know, here's the problem that everybody's going to run to. Let's just pick NVIDIA as a, uh, since it's the poster child of this rally, let's just- Yeah, and, and, I mean, let's call it spade a spade. There is absolutely no way that NVIDIA can justify its current valuation unless it basically like owns the world. <laughs> but but go ahead. <laughs> Pretty much. Yeah. And, and we went through that analysis, I think, last last Friday. Last we week. Yeah. Yeah. So um, but no. So let's just pick on it. So the problem is with NVIDIA, let's say I wanted to buy it today. Right. I'm going to buy it at the current price. The problem is, is a rational stock price is about 30 to 35 to 40 percent below where it is right now. That's how big of a run up this thing has had. It's four standard deviations above its weekly moving average. And so if you look at standard deviation analysis, that's 99.999 percent of all potential price movement from that moving average is already into the stock. So your only rational stop level is at that moving average, which is you'll have to lose a big chunk of your investment just to get down there before you even get stopped out. So, you know, and the problem is, is that most investors will put a stop somewhere. It's like, oh, yeah, I'm going to buy NVIDIA here and I'm going to stop $10 below where I bought it. It can do that in a day. And then you're stopped right. out. And here's what happens. You get stopped out. Then the stock runs right back up. And you will see stops don't work. So then you buy it and then it corrects 50%, right? And that's the way markets are going to work. And so, you know, two things like we've owned, in fact, uh, you know, I know we'll talk about trades later, but just today we added to our Procter & Gamble position and our AbbVie position in our portfolio. We love these two stocks, right? They're boring as hell. They don't do anything except pay a dividend and grow over time. That's all they do. Um, but, you know, we regularly buy and sell these stocks. We've owned them since we started, you know, since we started. They've been long-term core holdings. We'll, we'll own them after I'm dead. Uh, we'll keep owning these stocks. But when they run up, we sell some of the position. And so, and, and this is the way you should treat a position in your portfolio. So you, you buy NVIDIA, let's say you buy 3% of the position of your portfolio. Um, it takes off running um, like a scalded ape and you know it's gonna correct at some point. So the 3% is now 4% of your portfolio. You trim it back to three. Eventually it corrects. Your 3% position becomes 2% because of the correction. You then buy it back up to three. And if you keep doing that over time, A, you'll own the position long term. B, you'll take profits along the way. You'll hedge your risk on your downside. And that's what we're doing with, with AbbVie and, and, and Procter and & Gamble. We've owned them forever. We regularly buy and sell them. So when they run up a lot, we take profits. When they sell off, and, and AbbVie is notorious for having big sell-offs and then a massive run up. So every time it has these big sell-offs like it has now, because healthcare has been out of favor lately, we add to the position. 
So that's how you manage your portfolio positions over time and manage that risk. And that way you don't have to worry about trying to be all in or all out because that's what screws everybody up. You know, trying to be all in a stock or all out of a stock and trying to get back in, that's inevitably where you're ultimately going to make your mistake, where you buy it wrong and then you refuse to sell it and you lose a ton of money. All right. Um, Lance, I love it when you, you you do that where you basically just, you know, you're you're fully transparent about kind of how you as a portfolio manager can apply your craft here. And that's one of the things I really hope viewers get out of these weekly videos is, is seeing how a good portfolio manager actually thinks in the disciplines that they use, strategies and disciplines they use. And so, you know, even if someone's trying to do all this on their own, fine. If you feel you've got the skills, go try it out. But you're seeing how a real professional does it. Um, all right. So um, uh, I'm going to try to stay on the bull train uh, for a little bit longer. And I keep saying that because, of course, I got a whole bunch of bearish stuff that we're going to talk through later. Um, <clears throat> but one um, one chart that I saw the other day that really caught my attention was a chart that was put up by uh, Liz Ann Saunders. And it's showing that um, manufacturing construction spending is going parabolic with year over year growth climbing above 100% as of April. Um, and uh, I guess this was just, I hadn't really been paying attention uh, to this part of the economy uh, to see how violently spending is is increasing there. And I don't know exactly what's driving it. I'm, I'm guessing that it is largely funds from the Inflation Reduction Act. This is sort of the infrastructure spending bill. Uh, funds finally beginning to find their way into the economy. Um, you know, obviously, uh, that's you know that, that, that's bullish. That's, it's another right. capital inflow story going in there, right? And and of course, you know what I like about seeing money going into manufacturing is is you're kind of laying the groundwork for future productivity too. So uh, so, anyways, um, I found that that was you know okay. That that's a tick. Like okay, yeah, that's 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 a bullish sign going forward. <laughs> Love to hear any comments you have on that. And, and also, are there any other kind of big bullish catalysts on your radar that we haven't talked about yet? Well, no, uh, you know, I, I think, and, and maybe I'm wrong, but I thought we talked about the Monetary Conditions Index uh, last week on the show. I, I had written about that previously, and I touched on it again uh, on Friday. I have a report out on our website talking about monetary conditions, and that has been getting a lot better. So monetary conditions are a function of short and long-term rates, inflation, and the dollar. And one thing that we talked about previously in, in regards to the economy, one reason that we haven't seen that recession, right? You know, since last year, everybody's been predict predicting a recession, right? And there's plenty of reasons for it, right? Inverted yield curves, leading economic indicators. I mean, we can go through, you know, the, the litany of charts and data that says a recession is imminent, but it hasn't happened yet. And one of the reasons that it hasn't happened yet doesn't mean I'm not saying that, and I'm not saying that it won't happen. Yep. But one of the reasons it hasn't happened is because of all this liquidity that's still in the pipeline. Um, all that money we spent on monetary stimulus and in, in terms of sending checks to household. And then don't forget, we also had on top of that, we had uh, paid parent leave, we had child care acts, we had extended unemployment benefits. A lot of that didn't even expire until December of 2022. So there was a lot of support there. And then you also have, to your point, Adam, and this is the point I was getting to, on top of all that liquidity pump, then you had the $1.7 trillion in stimulus spending, which is now really just getting to a lot of those municipalities where they're starting to spend that money to you know, work in their cities to do whatever they're going to do with it. But then also funding for a lot of these, you know, green energy product uh, projects, et cetera. So that money, that construction and spending money for infrastructure is hitting the economy now. So that's keeping a lot of the, that's keeping this economic data from slowing down as much as we thought. And then most importantly, services, which is a big issue. Uh, and this was in last weekend's newsletter as well. Services make up 77 percent of the economy. Services spending is not recessionary. It's, you know, you take a look at the manufacturing data, uh, the Philly Fed Manufacturing Index, Richmond Fed, et cetera, all of those are in recessionary territory. Services are not. ISM services is still above 50 and, and, and has actually kind of expanded over the last uh, couple of reports. So, you know, with that being such a big chunk of the economy, that explains why between that and, of course, all this liquidity still in the system, that explains why the recession hasn't happened yet. Again, doesn't mean it won't. But the longer that we go without a recession, 
that's going to give the rest of the economy time to go through a recession, which you take a look at a lot of the manufacturing components. They've been in recession. Cyclical stocks have been in a recession. That time that they spend in that recessionary territory is going to allow them to start playing catch up because there's a, there's a natural pent up demand being built within the economy. So when you have a recessionary slowdown, people can track spending in certain areas, but eventually they've got to spend on whatever that is. So the longer you have in a time frame uh, of, to go through a cycle, then that gives you the ability to start recovering without having potentially as deep of a recession as everybody thought we were going to have initially. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, I guess that's maybe one of the best arguments I've heard for how the central planners could stick the landing here, right? Yeah. Which is for the first know, they, time ever. Yeah, first time ever. But how they how they could have kept with artificial um, uh, means, you know, the stimulus they all pumped in, they could have kept the the ship of state afloat long enough that that they could patch up all the holes in the hull and fix the problem by the time the the artificial uh, stimulus is out of the system. Um, right. Not necessarily calling for that, but I think that's probably one of the better arguments I've heard for how we may be able to have a, a softish landing here. Um, one point you mentioned, I just want to touch on for a second. Um, uh, the, you know, we've talked about this, right? We've, we've talked about how narrow uh, this market is in terms of its strength, right? How it's, it's really just flowing, you know, the, 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 the strength of the market, the strength of the indices, are really being powered by a single digit number of stocks pretty much right. at this point, right? <laughs> exactly. um, and the guys at New Harbor, I was talking to them yesterday and uh, they put up a, a chart that showed the um, the delta between um, a, a cap weighted index and an equal weighted index. Yep. And just to remind people, the major indices, the NASDAQ, the S&P, those are cap weighted indices so that the big companies have a much more bigger influence on the price of those in, uh, those indices than smaller companies that are within the, the indices themselves. Um, and there were two really notable things about the chart. One was that um, we hit extremes um, where the cap weight is, is way greater than the, the equal weight. Um, every time we hit an extreme there, a recession followed. Right, that happened right before the dot com, uh, or I would say a market correction followed right before the dot com uh, bubble burst, right before the the 08 crisis. Um, actually, even right before twenty twenty. Um, and now we are at a big extreme, right? So if if history rhymes, you know, we should expect some sort of market correction here. We're also at the greatest extreme in the data series. I think the data yeah. went back to like I think it was like a fifty year data series or something like that. Uh, so something would have to be different this time to avoid a pretty material market correction. Maybe what's different is there is so much liquidity still sloshing around that it gives all those other stocks their chance to go through their correction, recover, and then be back on the upswing by the time the excess finally starts leaving the drain here. I don't know. We'll see. Yeah, yeah. No, it's 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 a who knows thing right now. But yeah, it, you know, that's absolutely right. I mean, you know, historically you know, very narrow markets are not healthy. And, and when you have just a handful of stocks that are driving the market higher, you know, that's, you know, that can't really last that long. Right now, if you take a look at the, at the top 10 stocks of the S&P 500, um, the top 10 stocks market cap wise are the same as the bottom 426 combined. So, you know, there's it takes so for every so in other words for every dollar that goes in the top ten stocks absorb fifty percent of that dollar the bottom four hundred and twenty six stocks get the other fifty percent um, so that that just can't last forever so what has to happen here is ultimately and you know we talked about this absolute versus relative performance in the markets and you know we've kind of show, uh, just in case we got some new viewers this week. Um, you know, this is analysis that we do on our Simple Visor platform uh, that you can have access to. It's, it's it's there for you. But what this shows you is is this is the the rel this is the absolute and relative analysis of the of market sectors relative to the S and P. So this is the relative analysis, and on a relative basis, technology, communications, and consumer discretionary. So that's a little bit deceiving. You go, well, that's three sectors of the market. So that's not so bad, right? Well, the, the problem is, is technology is Apple, Microsoft, and NVIDIA. Communication services is Meta and Google. And discretionary is Amazon. 
That's it. That's what drives those three sectors. They're the biggest cap weighting in those in those sectors. Every other sector is is well oversold here. And so that really presents a problem in terms of that breadth that we're talking about. And and when we look at this on on kind of just a a scatter chart of, you know, of kind of the sector breakdown, we can see that, you know, you see the Air's communications, uh, discretionary technology all slammed in the right hand corner of this analysis. Everything else is in the weak category. So uh, that kind of, of, of deviation or this bifurcation in the market, it can't last long because eventually money flows have to go somewhere. So again, we were talking about earlier, the, all these other sectors, transportation and industrials and basic materials and all these things, healthcare, they're all in recessionary territory in terms of their performance relative to the economy. They're doing exactly what you would expect them to do during a recession. So at some point, they're going to come out of the cycle. These are eventually going to start to rotate up and to, you know, to the left and up and start moving back into improving territory. Technology will start to weaken and move down towards lagging territory. And so you'll get this rotation in the market. And because we have so many sectors that are so weak, that as that money rotates, the market should be able to withstand here. You know, maybe it doesn't go a lot higher, but it probably doesn't go a lot lower either as that rotation occurs, because there's enough other stocks out there to absorb those outflows from technology when we get to that point that people realize that valuations can't sustain, you know, those kind of levels of, of, of markets. I got to imagine the intensity of the rotation, though, does matter, right? So yeah, words, if a bunch of money starts flowing out of tech right now. Um, it's probably going to bring the indices down. <laughs> yeah, it will. No, it, it will, because you know, when you take a look at the top 10 stocks of the S&P 500 here, let me see, I've got, a, I've, hold on, I've got a chart of that too, give me a second. Um, but yeah, if you take a look at the breakdown of the top 10 stocks, in, in particular, because this is where you're going to see that rotation occur. And I thought I had it, but I don't, I'm sorry. Um, I thought I had one uh, available real handy, but I don't. Um, but what you'll see is that the top 10 stocks of the S&P 500 are Applesoft, uh, Applesoft Apple, <laughs> Apple, Microsoft, Google One, Google Two. There's two Googles in the top 10 stocks. So you've got two Googles, Apple, Microsoft, NVIDIA, Tesla, Amazon, and who did I miss? Uh, I think that's it. And then the other, then the other two are Johnson & Johnson and Berkshire Hathaway. So that's your top 10 stocks. In the index, they're almost all technology. So when money comes out of technology stocks, yes, they're going to drag the market lower unless all that money rotates directly into other sectors of the market. Probably they won't. They'll probably go from tech into money market as long as money market is still yielding four or five percent. Got it. Yeah. Um, hey, just because people are going to ask, explain the two Googles. Uh, yeah, it's, a, it's basically a Google A share and a B share. Just. When they, they when they were when they renamed the company into Alphabet, they they split the stocks. So There's just two classes of stock, but they both trade. Uh, you can it's one's G O O G L and the other is G O O G, which is the one that most people follow. But there's also a, another Google. They and they trade identically. Uh, they track each other performance wise, but there's two Googles in the top 10 stocks. But, but they're both big enough that they're both in the top yeah, 10. Yeah. yeah. And, and it'd be remiss too, just to mention too, that Berkshire Hathaway um, also, That's part of sure. its market value is a big chunk of Apple, right? <laughs> that is correct. <laughs> yeah. All right. So, um, all right. So uh, I, 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 I also should just mention, um, we, we had a great lineup of speakers this week on the channel. Uh, we had John Rubino, we had David Rosenberg, and we had... Um, uh, Lakshman uh, Chuthan. And um, uh, the, the the sectors that you had up there where, where they're sort of heat mapped, right? You're color coded, right? Yeah. We've, we've got tech that's just on fire, right? I mean, it's just way, uh, that, that's where all the attention is right now. And you've got your consumer discretionaries and utilities and energy totally unloved out there. Um, these guys were saying, hey, look, you know, if, if we get the recession that that they are all predicting and, and they are predicting a hard landing recession for all the reasons we talked about in those videos. Folks are interested in go watch them. Um, but those are exactly the sectors that they were like, hey, if you're going to have exposure right now, you know, for a coming hard landing, you want to own uh, uh, staples and you want to own utilities, <laughs> you want to own uh, out of love, uh, but important essentials like energy and whatnot. So yeah. 
uh, for those that that are still thinking that okay, look, I'm I'm still my personal <laughs> thesis is recession ahead. You know, you may be able to get into some of these things at a good relative value right now. Yeah, no, look, I mean, it's you know, our portfolio is split between cyclicals and defensives, and we own defensives for both valuation reasons as well as dividends and those other things. But look, our portfolio is dragging this year because we don't have you know, our portfolio is not eighty percent tech. So. You yeah, know, some idiot. I heard some idiot there sold out of Nvidia at, at the I end did. of last year. I, absolutely, I no, not the end of last year. Earlier this year. Uh, earlier. Oh my we, god, that guy. I hope you fired him. Yeah, I should have because that's <laughs> freaking ridiculous. But yeah, but yeah, but that was you know we we were looking at that stock at the time. It was four standard deviations overbought back then, and you know just it just kept on going. And, and as I've to, as I told you many yeah. times, as you've taken your mea culpa, you yeah. you sold for a profit. You, nobody can ever feel bad about that. <laughs> But I did buy AMD a couple of weeks ago. We're up like 30% on that in two weeks. So there you go. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> so anyway, um, you know, the, the point here, though, is that if we get a rotation in the markets, and we should, right, just because I was saying, you know, if you just look at normal how markets work, you should see a rotation from technology to, and, and discretionary communications to these other sectors. And a lot of these stocks are really beaten up. There's a there's a lot of very cheap companies trading at deep discounts, trading two and three standard deviations below their moving averages. Those are when you want to buy stocks. Nobody wants to buy them because they're beaten up, they're in love, they're they're losing money right now. It's like if you buy them, you're going to lose money. It's like I don't want to lose money, but that's when you want to buy stuff. You want to buy stuff when nobody wants it, and then you got to be patient and let it work for you. And this is the one. This is the big challenge that our clients have and that investors have in general is understanding that markets rotate. And so, you know, eventually we, we look, we have these tech stocks, we're eventually gonna sell and take profits there. That doesn't mean we sell everything, just means we reduce position sizes. And we're, and, and like I said, today, we bought Procter & Gamble. abbey has been under a lot of pressure lately. We bought more TLT yesterday um, with the, with the uh, passage of the Senate bill. So, you know, we're adding to our bond exposure. That's all unloved stuff. Nobody wants that stuff, but that's why we're buying it because that's where money's going to rotate to when this thing does eventually turn. Okay, great. And, Recession and, or not. Recession or not, it's going to happen. Well, exactly. That, that, that's my point, which is I heard you saying recession or not, it's going to happen. And then my point was, but if we get a recession, it may actually speed that up, right? It may actually increase the magnitude of that, the benefit of that rotation to those currently unloved sectors. All right. Well, look, let's get on to um, the debt ceiling resolution. Um, the, the bill that was passed in Congress uh, is called the Fiscal Responsibility Act. I see you already chuckling there. Uh, continuing likely the long uh, established trend of naming bills in Congress that probably actually have the opposite effect. But but let, let's not let's not go there yet. Um, let's just talk about what's in it really quickly. Um and I'm, I'm looking at some of this stuff for the first time myself. So first off, the debt limit um, was, so they've agreed to raise the debt limit and they've agreed that they're not going, that it's suspended until January 1st, 2025, right. right? So basically spend like a drunken sailor, you know, until after the election. And I think this is probably a big win that Joe Biden wanted to get, right? Because it just removed the specter of this coming back to haunt him in the middle of a presidential election. Yeah. Um, there are increases in spending in defense spending. Um, uh, so, you know, while there are some cuts in here, they're really pretty minor and, and offset in certain cases by increased spending in other places. So defense gets more money. Um, veterans medical care goes up too. And I don't think too many people are going to take issue with that. Um, Non-defense discretionary spending is capped. Um, I it's too much texture to know exactly what the number is, but it's 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 really not that aggressive. I mean, it's more capped. There aren't that many spending cuts going on here. Um, there are going to be some clawbacks for pandemic era funding, uh, about thirty billion uh, that that was earmarked to get spent for pandemic related issues. And and I think sane thinking is coming in now and saying, look, pandemic's behind us. We don't need to keep spending on that. Let's not do that. Um, a big issue that Republicans have fought for is for stricter eligibility um, in uh, some benefits programs like uh, the SNAP food assistant program and whatnot, where you're not just going to get uh, the benefit anymore uh, if you're below a certain uh, economic level. You're going to have to actually, it's going to be tied to work or at least tied to the attempt to get work. Um, there's some permitting reform for energy uh, to try to get energy projects, uh, you know, through red tape faster. Uh, yeah. Another 
uh, interesting one is that student loan payments, which have been in forbearance uh, for I think over two years now, are going to uh, kick in again. Um, the, the the FRA doesn't talk about this, but but that's also sort of tied to the government's um, uh, debt forgiveness program, um, which is still up in the air right now. It's currently, I think, on the Supreme Court's docket, but there seems to be growing um, resistance. And I think Joe Manchin, who's been a key player in all of this, uh, is is now falling on the side of, hey, that thing needs to be forgotten about. Like we, we, you know, it's 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 basically you know shifting the burden unfairly from the borrowers to the taxpayer. We'll see what happens there. Um, there's some other elements here. I'm just trying to think if there's anything really big here. No, I think we we talked about most of them. So um, I, I've got the qu a, a couple questions about the ramifications of, of some of those issues. But real quick, I'd just like to get your first kind of high level take on on all this. Well, first of all, it's it's the typical negotiation process, and and you know Kevin McCarthy uh, came out after his you know after he got this deal done. He says, "Well, I could only negotiate on 11 percent of the budget." And that's a true statement, right? You know, because when you go in and you're going to cut spending and you go, okay, well, we're going to cut spending, but you can't touch mandatory spending. So what's mandatory spending, right? So let's talk about the budget uh, real quick. So just in case everybody doesn't know, let's just bring everybody up to speed. What's the budget? The budget in the United States government is broken down into two parts. You have mandatory spending and discretionary spending. Mandatory is what the word says. You have to pay it regardless of what occurs. Mandatory spending is interest on the debt, which has been going up because of interest payments. Social Security, Medicaid, uh, Medicare, um, prescription drug benefits, and, and veterans benefits. Those have to get paid regardless. And, and then, by the way, and we said this before about the whole debt ceiling debate, it was like, well, if we don't pass the debt ceiling, we're not going to pay seniors. Bull crap, because that has to be paid. That was, in, that was in the 1995 bill that was passed. Mandatory spending always gets paid. And what's discretionary, that's the stuff we have some control over, then we can cut spending over there. Okay, so now we move from about 70% of the budget, which is mandatory, to the 30% that's not mandatory. By the way, it takes more, it takes almost as much of every tax dollar that we have coming in just to pay the mandatory spending. That's why we keep going into debt more and more, because all the discretionary spending has to be done out of debt. And the more interest rates go up, the more it eats into those tax dollars, which means that virtually every dollar we have coming in in terms of tax revenue goes just to cover mandatory spending. Okay, so now let's talk about the non-mandatory spending, the discretionary piece over here that uh, Kevin McCarthy had to deal with. Well, the first thing they said was, is don't touch defense. <laughs> so once you cut defense out of the discretionary spending, you get about 11% of the budget left. That's it. So what are you going to cut? Well, there's some great places you could have cut. You could have gotten rid of the Department of Energy, the Department of Education, the Department of Health. Could have gotten rid of all that stuff because those are actually those are actually organizations that should be run by individual states. It's not the job of the government to do those things. That's a different argument for a different day. But yep. you could have cut a lot of spending over there. Uh, but they don't want to do that, right? So, so the reality is the situation is that we always come to these debt ceiling debates. Everybody's like, you know, rah rah. You know, the Republicans we're going to go cut spending. I did political talk radio for over a decade, and I interviewed every one of these guys. Uh, every time we got around, in 2011, during the whole debt ceiling debate, I was interviewing these congressmen and senators about the debt ceiling. Oh, you know, Congress, we have control of the purse, and boy, we're going to whites their eyes. We're going to cut spending and never did anything, right? It's all theater. It's all show to tell you what they want, and they want to tell you what you want to hear. And when they get to Washington, it's all about what their political contributors and what the corporations want, because that's who feathers their pockets. And I'm not telling I'm not this isn't conspiracy theory. This is just reality. of the No, world. this is just the way the world works. Yeah. So, so don't you don't be upset that we passed the debt ceiling deal and got no real benefit. We were never going to get any type of cuts. It was never going to be. on. The, so it is what it is. The bad part about all this is, is that how we count for these things. So they say, well, we cut spending. We cut spending by $30 billion. No, you just, uh, you, did, you just unspent money that was already slated to be spent, but didn't get spent. Right. That's just basically moving a $20 bill from one sleeve in your wallet to the other. You didn't cut spending, but that's the way we count it, right? We count that towards cutting spending. The CBO came out and said, oh, this is going to cut spending by the, budget, or the deficit by a trillion dollars over the next decade. 
Whenever the Congressional Budget Office says anything, they're lying. They have never been right about anything ever. In 2000, they said we'd be running a trillion dollar deficit by 2010. We got to 2010, we were running a trillion dollar deficit. They are never right because they never factor in these, these sunset clauses and the, and, the, and the increased spending that occurs on a budget baseline basis every year in Washington, that 8% increase that occurs every year in Washington. None of that stuff gets factored in. So that's why they're always wrong. So we're going to wind up spending a lot more money over the next two years. We'll spend probably another four to six trillion dollars of debt by the time we get to January 1st of 2025. There's no breaks on anybody to spend anything. This was great for the Democrats because now they can pretty much spend money at will at this point, as long as they can get stuff passed through the House and the Senate. They've got really a lot of leeway to spend more money. There's no real and in, in, in regardless of what you think about re Republicans and Democrats, they all want to spend money. So if yeah, you come up with deal, exactly, yeah. they, they all want to spend money. So anything that comes up that they can spend money on, they're going to do it. So, you know, we're talking about 31 trillion in debt today. If I'm still doing this show with you on January the 1st of 2025, we'll be talking about $36 trillion of debt by the time we get there. So, you know, it's, it, but this is a problem ultimately. Um, and this is going to be, you know, the issue of slow economic growth. The more debt we have, the slower the economic growth rate is. Inflation will, will slow uh, below 2%. Interest rates will fall below 2%. None of that's good. Um, none of that creates economic prosperity. Your wealth gap will continue to get worse. Um, but those are the things that we have to look forward to over the next couple of years. Now, short term, the student loan debt is the most important thing. The student loan debt is about... $40 billion a year in deferred payments that people haven't been having to spend. So if you're talking about, now we were talking about earlier how the market's bullish right now and, and you know right now there's enough going on, doesn't look like a lot of recession anytime soon at this point. The student loan moratorium is a potential factor that could lead to a recessionary outcome in the economy and here's why. Now, first of all, the moratorium ends at, at the end of June the first payment's not due till September the 1st, my understanding. I, I may be wrong on the dates, but it's somewhere like that. Um, but once we get to that September 1st date line, now all of a sudden households that have student loans have to start remaking their payments again. The average payment is about $393 a month. So all of a sudden, when you start talking about 40 million students that are all having to pay on average $393 a month out of their pocket, on student loan debt versus they've been spending that 393 on average buying stuff in the economy, that's a real potential slowdown. That's $40 billion a year over the, you know, when, and this will really get set the impact up for, and again, you know, I, I said before that we probably won't have a recession this year. If we're gonna have one, it'll be probably early next year. That's what the student loan debt could provide is that slowdown in retail spending that causes the economy to contract into a recession in 2024. Okay. So I had two questions for you about this. That was one of them, right? It was the impact of, of the, the student loan repayment. Um, real quick, uh, just some tweaks to your numbers, 45 million affected students, um, and they have to start <laughs> payments again no later than August 30th. So the impact of this may have should be felt. That's in September the 1st, August 30th, <laughs> with two days. <laughs> uh, but it sounds like some of them may be starting to have to be repaying before yeah. then, right? So, um, uh, but but okay. So I, I, you're you you articulated exactly my concerns even better than I would have. Um, <clears throat> now combine that with the Treasury being forced to refill the Treasury General account uh, coming out of this right now. Um, we've talked about this a bit before, but it is a not insubstantial. Uh, amount of liquidity that's going to start getting pulled from the system by this as the treasury has to sell bonds to refill the TGA, which has been drawing down over the past uh, couple quarters to, to fund government while the debt ceiling has been in place. Um, I just want to give some quick stats here. Um, uh, uh, so quotes I found in the news, uh, I'm trying to remember where I got the source from this, but um, uh, in the past five months, the TGA dropped 360 billion of actual, not annualized dollars. Um, that amounts to about 3.3 percent of five months of nominal GDP. That's one good reason why growth seemed resilient over the past five months. Looking forward, assuming the Treasury raises 650 billion, 
to put on deposit at the Fed in the next three months, that would amount to a drain equal to almost 10% of three months of nominal GDP. Um, so th this switch from add to drain is meaningful, this guy is saying. Um, so how how big of an impact is this? Um, especially right as, well, I guess this would happen probably right before the student the loan debt <laughs> yeah. the loan debt has to start getting repaid. So it's almost going to be like a one-two punch, right? So, so first of all, the the refilling of the TGA is certainly going to pull liquidity out of the market. You know, I run that liquidity index we show here from time to time. Yep. So part of that is the TGA funding, and so when they have to refill the TGA, that will draw down that liquidity to some degree. Um, now, just to put things in perspective, when we do a bond auction, we do about forty billion dollars at normal bond auctions on average, right? They they vary in size, but on average, they're about forty billion dollars whenever we do a bond auction. Um, do we need to explain how a bond auction works? You know, what? sure. Do we assume sure. everybody knows this? G give the quick version. Yeah, the quick version is is that when the the treasury issues debt to cover spending that we can't pay for through revenues. So whenever we talk about the treasury issuing bonds, the reason they're doing that is we don't have enough revenue to cover our spending, so they're filling in the difference. There's 20 primary dealers around the world, and these are your major banks. And so in a normal environment, what happens is the treasury says, hey, I've got bonds for sale. The 20 primary dealers say, I'll buy these bonds, but I'm going to buy them for this price. And that's what sets the yield because price and yields are inverse of each other. The lower the price is, the higher the yield and vice versa. So if the treasury comes in and offers a lot of debt and the buyers say, well, I really don't wanna own it here, the treasury has to come down in price to find a buyer pushing the yield up and that's how the market works. So now- Because normally, eventually somebody will say, oh, well, if the yield's going that high, yeah, I'll buy I'll it. Take it. Exactly. And so that's how the auctions get done. And auctions always get done. No matter how big the auction is, they almost always get done. Um, if there's any hitches, we'll, we talk about a failed auction from time to time. Generally, the next day they're sold. So, you know, the auction, the bonds always get sold and, and, and because everybody knows they're going to get paid eventually. It just depends on what price that they get bought at. Now, in a normal environment, what would happen then is let's say that Adam, I'm the treasury and Adam is, is Bank of America or Goldman Sachs, whoever, he, whoever one of the primary dealers are. He buys the bonds from me. I say, great, there's Adam, there's your bonds. And then Adam turns around and sells them to all of his clients. So all the customers of, of Goldman Sachs or Bank of America, they all step up and they buy the, the bonds from Bank of America. So now they all own it. The, the, the Treasury pays interest and it goes to all the bondholders. Well, starting in 2010, when we started quantitative easing, that was the switch. Because now what happens, uh, and this is what happened uh, you know, through last year, or actually through 2021, is that Adam would buy the bonds as Goldman Sachs and he would turn around and sell them to, to Mike over here who's with the Fed. And so it was a closed loop. It never got to the customers. Yeah, I, so I was going to joke about that where, yeah, yeah, very different world from now where we are today because in the yeah. past, the Fed just showed up and said, I'll take them all. <laughs> exactly. And so now this is a difference. So the reason I bring this up and the reason why this is important is that it is different. The Fed is not buying the bonds. So now the banks have to buy the bonds and have to sell them off to the customers again because the Fed's not standing there as a buyer. So that may affect some yield in the short term. But here's the big point about all this. The, the, the Treasury will issue these bonds. They will get bought. We may see a small uptick in rates in the near term. I would buy that rate uptick and add to my bond exposure if that occurs. And that's what we'll be doing. Because once this is funded, if we start to end, and if all this other stuff is right, if Dave and Rosenberg is right, I'm not going to argue with David. I used to go drinking with David way back in the day. Not going to argue with that guy. If he's right, um, you know, you're going to see, and, and we have a recession, yields are going to fall sharply. So I would, you know, as, as, a, as, a, as a bond investor, use the uptick in rates that it comes from the TGA refunding as an opportunity to buy bonds. Okay. And you mentioned that you guys just started increasing your exposure to TLT this week, presumably for that Thank trade you. that you're just talking about there. Are, are you, um, if you're buying now and the TGA does go through this refilling process and it has to increase yields in bonds to get buyers to buy all these bonds, TLT is going to go down for a period of time, right? Maybe. So maybe, but, but are, so are you buying in more sort of like we're, we're doing like a, like a dollar cost average or just yeah. like a programmatic buy. We, we expect that it could go down as we're buying into this and Hey, not bad. Cause we're getting something we think is going to be more valuable in the future at a lower price. But then once 
the TGA is done doing that. And if we then, the recession does show up, you're betting that yields come down and the value of that portfolio goes up. Correct. Yeah. So first of all, yeah, we're nibbling at this. So the, and, and two, there's no reason there's there there there's no guarantee that interest rates are actually going to go up. Here's why. And this is something nobody's thinking about. And I'm not smart than anybody else. I just thought about it first. <laughs> so well, that, um, that's kind of a death, but, sign of intelligence. But, but go but ahead. What is everybody, do, Adam? What is everybody doing right now with money? Buying Nvidia. Besides buying Nvidia, if, it, <laughs> if you bearish the market, what are all your listeners doing with their money right now? Most they are likely. buying T bills or money market funds. Money market funds. What's in a money market fund? Money yeah. market funds. Yeah, <laughs> very short T bills. Right, one month, three month, up to one year T bills. Maybe the the bonds that the Treasury will issue to refund the TGA will be all short term bills. They've got a massive buyer standing there in money market funds right now to buy those bonds. So there is not a real guarantee that rates will uptick because there is enough demand out there with everybody slamming money into money market funds right now. And the fact that the treasury, the treasury is not going to come out and, and issue 10 year, t, uh, 10 year bonds at 3.7%, right? 3.8%. They don't want to lock in that high right. rate. They don't want to lock in those the, today's higher rates. Right. So they're going to come in, they're going to issue one month, three months, six months, one year bills which is all of what money market funds are going to buy. So, you know, or pension funds or anybody else that needs to store cash, it's all in that short end of the range. So there is plenty of buying power right now to real fee- refill that TGA without moving rates. Okay. Yeah, it's a good point. All right. So, um, so anyways, I've had a lot of people who've been asking about, hey, give an update on TLT. I think we just gave a pretty good one here. Um, but it sounds like you are you are increasing your exposure. Again, sounds like in a, in a moderated uh, at a moderated pace right now. And presumably at some point, as we get further along into this, if things continue to go the trajectory you're you're expecting them to, there may come an inflection point where you say, okay, this is where we're really shifting money into here now. Well, we've, well, we've already got a pretty large holding in TLT. And we're just going to build up towards our target holding, which will be about 20% of the portfolio when we get there. So, you know, we've got plenty of time you know, there, there's because of our size weighting that we have now, and the fact we when we built into it earlier this year as well. So every time we have these little opportunities where we can, you know, pick up some cheaper prices on T, on TLT, we continue to do that. So we're to the point now that there's not going to be this inflection point where it's like, oh, we're, we bought ten percent today because we don't need to buy ten percent. We just need about eight percent more in our portfolio. So we'll just slowly grow into that over time. Great. Hey, I want to make a, a personal point here because I think it's instructive for listeners. So, um, <clears throat> you know, you and I talk, we talk every week, we chit, chit chat after we uh, we record. And, um, you know, a few months back, you talked about on air about how you had uh, you know taken kind of a personal uh, speculative position on TLT, um, which I think worked out well for you at the time. I actually was like, yeah, I'm going to follow Lance into that, right? So I did, and I bought long-term uh, options, and it was going to hold it for a short period of time. And when you sold, I was going to sold, sell. But um, you know, I just I'm freaking busy, right? You know, I, I, I yes, I talk about the markets all the time, but I don't sit glued to a trading screen the way that you and your team do. And I'm pretty positive. You, you tell me, but I'm pretty sure you got out of that speculative position. Yeah. Um, I didn't because by the time I picked my head up, you know, yields had had come back or had gone back up. TLT had gone down, um, and so you know now I'm just sort of in the like, all right, do I just sell and lose it, or do I just hold on and you know wait maybe for the TGA or, or sorry for the 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 next downturn in yields to to come rescue me here. Um, but the point I'm trying to underscore here, um, beyond just you know Adam can is human and makes mistakes too, is like I'm just busy. Right, I'm yeah. really busy running wealthy on, and and I don't have the opportunity to really babysit these positions the way that obviously you and your the way that a financial good financial advisor does, right? And and that's why I work with a professional financial advisor. I actually work with several um, because I'm just honest with myself, right? That I just don't have the bandwidth to you know be doing all the gardening that you talk about right i'm i'm outsourcing that to somebody who will do a better job of it than i uh and so you know i know that you guys are great at doing things like sharing you know your simple visor platform with folks so if they want to do it themselves and and if they want to copy your playbook they can 
and they can get access to that information. And if, look, if you can get access to that information and you've got the bandwidth and the experience uh, to, to dependably follow it, great, more power to you. I just don't think that most people have the bandwidth and the expertise to do that. They can get the information, but they don't necessarily have the bandwidth to, to put it into action consistently to avoid some of the pitfalls like I you know just shared that I fell into here. So um, I, I just, you know, I know I talk about all the time on this channel about the importance of working with a good professional financial advisor, but I think that's a really good example of even somebody like me who talks about all this stuff all the time and people would think, oh, Adam, you know, you can get into other stuff, you know, all the time. I, I do when I can, but more often than I'd like, you know, I just get busy. And then when I pick my head up, the opportunity has has been missed. Um, and I'm like, geez, if I if I had just given it to somebody who did have the bandwidth to do this, I would have been fine. Yeah, no, it's, it's you know, it's, a, it's such a funny thing that you bring up because I'm the world's worst plumber because, you know, I'm so busy managing my clients money that and I, I can't trade in front of my clients. Right. That's a that's a legal no, no. So I have to trade my account after I trade all my clients accounts yeah. and half the time I forget. So, you know, I do this stuff for my clients and I forget to do it for myself. You're the, you're um, the cobbler whose kids have no shoes. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. And, and that's, but it's just because I'm so, I'm so busy doing everything else that I've got to do to make sure my clients are, our, our clients are taken care of. And, you know, I've got a great team of guys that I work with, you know, Danny and Richard and Mike and the list goes, you know, John Penn and, you know, just, just goes on down the list. Just a, just a tremendous number of great people in our, in our firm that make sure all of our clients are taken care of, but it's just a very busy process all the time. And by the time I get home and, and, you know, I, the last thing I want to do when I get home is look at my stuff. So, you know, I need an advisor to take care of me half the time. So, but, um, but it, you know, it's important as two things to your, to your point though, is that one, the best place you're going to make money is in your job. That's where you're going to make your money. I, I try to tell this to people all the time is that, you know, if you try to use the stock market to make up for a lack of savings, you're going to wind up losing a lot of money because you'll be too aggressive in the markets. And if you treat the market like a casino, it'll treat you like a casino and it'll take your money. So you need to focus on what you do best to earn your savings, because that's where we're going to build wealth from. Wealth comes from savings, not from investing. All investing is there for is to make sure- Savings and income, but yes. Yeah, savings and income. What Active investing income. is there for is to make sure your savings and your income are adjusting for inflation over time, so that those purchasing power parities are the same over time, but your wealth will come from what you save. And, and so the, the more that you focus and build that, you know, increase your career, look for opportunities, you know, do, do other stuff, real estate, whatever it is, to build that wealth, then the investing side of the portfolio will help keep that wealth intact. And this is the part that people misunderstand. They, 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 they try to make up for a lack of savings by, you know, trying to gamble in the markets and say, well, if I can just take this $10,000 and turn it into a million dollars, I'll be fine. It never works. Yeah, um, I, I think that's really important for folks to understand. You, you sort of mentioned versions of that in previous uh, appearances on this channel. Um, I think the only tweak I'd say is, is um, uh, there's there's <clears throat> wealth creation, right? Which is what you do basically by bringing value into the world, right? By, by being a good employee or creating a business or whatever. Um, and and then basically there's there's wealth stewardship, you know, wealth protection. Um, uh, and, and, you know, wealth curation, if you will. And that's that's what a good financial advisor does. All right, look, um, uh, I got a couple other topics I want to get to before we uh, we finish up here and I can I can see the clock here telling me that we, we don't have a ton of time left. Um, I would totally be remiss if we didn't talk about the jobs information uh, that we've seen this week. Um, I pulled a bunch of data here and then we had this just bananas um, payrolls number that came out today. So hopefully we can talk about both, Lance. Um, maybe if I can just start here really quickly. Um, uh, so uh, really interesting, some of the most recent number that, that's, numbers that came out this week showed that uh, there's just head scratching numbers at this point in time. So um, uh, since COVID levels, according to the BLS, we have now added 3.3 million jobs. Right. So, you know, the administration can say, OK, you know, we've actually created a job. We've recovered and we've, we've created new jobs. Right. Um, all of that, all of that increase is in part time jobs. Yeah. Right. Um, 
what's and we've talked about that and, and you can say hey you know maybe that's not such a great sign of a healthy workforce because in general it's showing that people have to work multiple jobs to be able to continue to get by right what's really interesting now is that um pretty much all of that growth that we saw is going to foreign born workers and not native born ones um, and, and I don't, I don't, I don't want to get embroiled in the political issues around that. I just want to identify that that could become a political issue in this coming uh, presidential campaign next year, which is like, whoa, wait a minute, you, really? You're telling me that that jobs growth isn't benefiting, you know, Americans that have been born and grown up here, that we're we're basically importing people in to take the jobs away from the Americans that have been here. Um, I'm, I'm not going to put a value judgment on it. I'm just going to say I can see that being a potentially very politically sensitive issue going forward, especially if the job markets continue to weaken from here. And there's some really interesting stats that just came out today that you and I will talk about. But I'm just curious, do you have any yeah. anything to yeah, say no. about those stats I mentioned? No, absolutely. On the on the foreign born workers, this is something I actually wrote about previously. Is that, you know, you have to also look at the culture of what's going on right now. And I can and look, I can tell you this from my kids. Um, let's, I'll use my kids as an example. My kids are spoiled, right? Um, you know, they they lived in nice houses growing up. They went to nice schools, you know, public schools, not private schools. Um, but they didn't really want for a whole lot of stuff. So when so I've told you before is that when my kids turn 16, I make all my kids go to work. They have to go get a job. And I don't care what the job is, but they've got to go get a job and they've got to work and they've got to pay for their car note. They've got to pay for their insurance. They've got to pay for their own gas, those type of things. Well, in the state of Texas, um, 18, you have to be 18 to get like a real job. So under 18, you're working, you know, you're a lifeguard at the, you know, the local pool, those type of things. So the, the jobs aren't real plentiful for 16 to 18 year olds. But once you turn 18, well, now you can get a job doing pretty much anything. And what was interesting is, is that my kids were really, they pushed back hard on me about working at fast food, which, you know, I grew up doing. <laughs> so and everybody else, you know, I, you know, everybody I know grew up being a fry cook or, you know, a dishwasher or whatever at a, at a fast food restaurant, you know, growing up. And they really pushed back. They're like, I, I don't want to do that. So they, they all found jobs doing other stuff. The two of them became waiters at a restaurant. And, you know, another one did work for an auto mechanic shop, but they figured it out. But my point about this is, is that foreign workers, when they come here, they are not privileged in the, in, in the manner that, you know, they're willing to take whatever work they can get. And so they're filling a lot of these traditional jobs that were going to native born Americans, native born teenagers in particular, um, earlier in you know, kind of in our life cycle where we all grew up and we all worked at Wendy's or McDonald's or whatever it was in the kitchen. A lot of those jobs are now going to form born workers. Um, and a, a lot of the jobs that our kids should be doing is either they're not working, right? And and they're not. Their, their parents aren't making them get a job. They're like going straight from high school to college and they're not getting that work experience or they're not wanting to do those jobs and they're doing other things. So it's, so it's interesting. And where have all these jobs that you're talking about, where if we take a look at the employment stats, where are those jobs that have been created? Fast food, leisure, healthcare, right? That's Those are the ones that, that are getting filled. So it's, it's more of a culture thing as much as it is a potential political argument of, you know, immigration. And of course, we talk about the open borders and all this other stuff. But a lot of it's a culture thing right now between native born Americans and, and what they're willing to do versus what uh, foreign born workers are willing to do for a job. Yeah, I, I don't disagree at all. And look, I live out in Northern California, you know, in orchards and vineyards, right? I mean, you got the fruit pickers out here, um, which is a job that Americans haven't wanted to do, native born Americans haven't wanted to do for decades, right? I mean, back to grapes of wrath, you know, times. <laughs> exactly. um, so I, I totally agree with you on that. Um, I, I, I do think th this is the first time I've seen headlines pick up on this and be like, whoa, wait a minute, right? Or like, we're all the jobs aren't going to native born Americans anymore. And this cultural reason could be a really big part of it. I just think if we, you know, it's one thing when when we have this really robust jobs market and there's way more openings than there are for applicants and stuff like that. I could see this becoming a flashpoint if we get into a jobs recession where people are all of a sudden saying, whoa, wait a minute, you know, why are our policies 
at that point, it'll be perceived as taking away jobs. So anyway, right. we'll, we'll see if this turns into something. I just wanted to flag it. Um, okay. Uh, I'm just going to pull some highlights here. W one thing that I, 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 interesting discussion I had um, where uh, Lakshman um, and I were talking about how, you know, the, the employment uh, domino and Michael Kantrowitz's hope framework really has been the bulwark um, kind of keeping recession at bay or been a big bulwark in keeping recession at bay. And, you know, we were talking about some reasons in which the unemployment number may not move, you know, all that much. Watchman was looking at a couple of different data points. He's like, ah, yeah, maybe, maybe it's not going to move all that much. But then I asked him about productivity. You know, he, 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 charts economic cycles and i said what are your cycles charts telling you about worker productivity and he was just like oh my god he's like it's just terrible <laughs> he said, like it's it's just been falling off a cliff it's really bad um and um uh you know at the end of the day it kind of almost doesn't matter how many employees you have it matters what value you're creating in society and how that's goosing gdp and all that type of stuff um so uh you know, th that's not looking good. And then, of course, you know, some of the things that he was talking about that that could keep employment, unemployment from moving very much, he didn't have a high confidence in them. It was kind of like, well, hopefully, maybe, you know, we have a we have a lot of retiring skilled workers right now and boomers that are leaving. And, and it's actually really hard uh, to replicate uh, that experience, you know, that 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 50 year carpenter just had. Right. And so we need to hire two people to take his place. I'm like, okay, yeah, uh, I get that you're you're kind of employing people, but I'm like, but that's not really great economically, right? Where you have to basically hire more people to do the job less well than the right. employee that you just lost, right? Right. Well, I'm not going to get robotics will eventually take over for everybody. So there you go. Well, and you and I have had that conversation, right? I mean, if 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 automation and AI really picks up the way that a lot of people are salivating about right now, it's going to have a massive impact on the employee landscape. Okay, so. Um, what was interesting is, is that I woke up to this morning um, and we had this payrolls number that just blew away. Um, I think it was like a six sigma deviation um, yeah. from the data. And we've been having these beats. I think it's like 12 out of the past now. 13 numbers have, have no. been beats. 14 now. Okay. We were, 14, we, were okay. we were at 13 beats last month and now we're at 14 straight beats. So we beat the estimate 14 months in a row and that is the longest duration in the history of the employment report ever, and not by a small margin. This is by a huge margin that we beat the number this many times without having one month where you were even close to being right. Yeah. And then, of course, you know, the revisions hit retroactively when they, they announced these beats. They didn't go back. Nobody cares. And, Nobody cares. Nobody well, listens to revisions. Well, and that's what's so interesting here, right? So um, we know that these numbers are super suspect in many ways. And you and I have talked about this ad nauseum, but the today's payroll number came in at uh, what? At, at uh, something like 375,000, I think. Um, where is this? Uh, 231,000 of which uh, are um, just assumptions that BLS made with its birth death uh, modeling. Right. Yeah. So it's basically an Excel plug. Right. So part of you just sort of wants to throw up your hand and say, well, look, you know, clearly the number is whatever they want to tell us it is. Right. <laughs> you know, whoever's, you know, working the Excel spreadsheet there at the BLS. So um, that was, uh, you know, another real head scratcher. Um, we can talk about, you know, the non impact it's had today on markets. Uh, you mentioned earlier that markets are still parting pretty hard today, probably largely from the debt ceiling resolution. But Normally, this would be a print that would maybe make the market say, hey, the Fed's going to have to continue, you know, its tightening efforts here, maybe a little bit more than we thought. And that would be depressive on the markets. Real quick before you react to that, though, the thing I want to mention here, and this is interesting, is that um, despite this big beat, we had a pretty dramatic jump in the unemployment rate. Right. But the unemployment rate went from 3.4% to 3.7%. Um so, you know, there's just so many freaking cross currents going on here in this this honestly really hard to swallow data that gets pumped out now on jobs by the government. Um, but you it know, is a pretty pronounced move in the unemployment rate like this could could be material if it continues. Yeah. No, I mean, look, it's the 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 employment numbers have been, you know, just amazingly strong. You have to remember that, yeah, you know, Biden's 
been in office that he's created 3.3 million jobs, whatever it is. But remember, all we're doing is recovering jobs we lost. We're not really creating a bunch of new jobs. And that's the important thing about you know growth of an economy is that you need to be creating stronger job growth over time. And, and we're not actually doing that. But again, you know, it is what it is. And you know, to your point, Adam, the thing that that the market should be focusing on, and, and really it's not the debt ceiling issue today as, as much as it is the employment numbers, and is that you know, this is very inflationary ultimately. I mean, this is not what the Fed wants to see. The Fed wants to see higher unemployment. And and the, the unemployment rate gets ticked around, you know, month to month because of, of calculations and things that go into it. But even at 3.7%, you're still extremely low unemployment. You know, the Fed's talking about four and a half to five percent unemployment to get the inflation rate down. And they're nowhere near that ballpark. So, you know, this is, you know, the, the market should take this going, oh my gosh. The Fed's going to have to really start to, to ratchet up rates again if they're going to get this inflationary uh, condition under control. Because the one big problem the Fed has is if the market loses confidence in the Fed at all and say, well, you know, Fed's got no control over anything, that's a bigger problem. And so the, the Fed, you know, it's going to have to, to uh, it won't surprise me, the next Fed meeting is on June the 14th. It won't surprise me to see the Fed come out with some pretty strong language about inflation and and the need to, to potentially stay focused on that inflation fight. Remember, at the last meeting, they said, well, we're going to, you know, we, we're hiking rates quarter point here, but we're going to kind of let tightening bank lending standards do the rest of the work. And so everybody kind of interpreted that as a pause. I don't think they're going to be able to do that. We'll see what happens on the 14th, but it won't surprise me if they see some, if we see some more hawkish language. Okay. All right. Well, look, um, I'm looking at my list. There's so many other great topics for us to get into here. Uh, but time is beginning to get tight here. So um, that was that next let's, week. let's get to your trades, just so we don't disappoint folks. Um, so you talked about nibbling on TLT. You talked about buying AbbVie and Procter & Gamble. Any other notable trades? Nope, that was it. Oh, okay. I took good notes then. <laughs> <laughs> okay. no, uh, no. Any, any other thing to say about kind of just your your decision making on the trades this week? No, no, like I said, just, you know, the we're looking for that second rotation and Friday's is real. I don't know if it's the beginning of a trend, um, but Friday was really strong on the sector rotation. Energy was doing well. Healthcare did well on Friday. Um, so hopefully we'll, if that continues, then we'll see some of these uh, kind of de more defensive names, maybe get a little bit of love here for a little bit and might see a little bit of a pullback in some of those tech names. We're not really seeing the pullback in the tech names by any stretch of the imagination, but um, at least have them cool off a bit. And, and remember, uh, things can correct in two manners. They can either go sideways for a while and let the moving averages catch up, or they have a correction back to the moving average. So if we get a rotation and tech just kind of hangs in there for a bit and goes sideways, that will also give an entry point to add tech to add tech to your portfolio if you need to. Okay, great. All right. Well, look, I want to end on um, one of the more uplifting stories that that I know of. Um, I, I've written about this in years past, but you know, we um, you said some very nice words last week about um, Memorial Day, and I uh, got a lot of nice reactions to folks in the comments, um, and uh, it got me reflecting about. Um, uh, one of the greatest stories I heard of from World War II, um, and uh, the, the guy I'm about to talk to wasn't even a soldier. Um, and so this is a great story about, you know, A, the many ways that people can serve or be in service, um, and also just sort of the power of one, right? The, the, the difference that one person can make in the world. And, and Lance, you and I have talked a little bit about, um, you know, the tenets of stoicism, and it's really all about just trying to be the best person you can be and leave the world a better place. It's a great example of this. Um, I'm going to presume you haven't heard of this guy, but but let's see if you have. Have you heard of a guy called Nicholas Winton? Yeah, go ahead. I know the story. You know the story? Okay. Well, I'm presuming a lot of folks probably don't. Um, he's often referred to as sort of Britain's um, Oscar Schindler. You know, if you saw Schindler's List that, that Spielberg had put out. Um, he, was, uh, he was almost like a student or a very young professional back uh, in the early days of, of uh, World War II, uh, even before the war had really broken out. And he was, I think, like on a skiing holiday in Czechoslovakia. Um, and uh, while he was there, the, um, the Nazi um, 
you know, kind of the purges against the, the Jewish population really began ramping up in earnest. And he kind of woke up to what was going on. And so he said, wow, you know, I, I, I got to help. Uh, I got to do what I can to help while I'm here. And he ended up appealing to the government back in Britain and said, look, um, uh, these Jewish people are going to get killed if they stay here. And uh, can we can we find a way to try to get some of these folks to safety? And basically, the, he arranged with the government that that the priority was for children. And so he started uh, a program where people in London could base or in Britain could basically um, donate to the government. Um, I think it was like fifty pounds or something like that, and that would get you know he would work to get the children out of. Czechoslovakia and, you know, on routes to where they could actually then uh, go to Britain and be placed with a foster family. And he did this for several years, or I guess for as long as he could, uh, and got a huge amount of kids um, to safety in Britain. And in many cases, uh, their families were, you know, later killed in concentration camps and whatnot. So he, he literally saved the lives of these children. So, you know, fast forward many decades after the war, he told nobody about this. Um, so he got married later on after he had, you know, after the war, never told his wife. Uh, she found, uh, the way she found out about it was she was like cleaning house. She found a ledger, handwritten ledger he had kept during this time and pieced together what he had done. So she ended up sort of sharing this with the media. And there's a great BBC special that ran where they kind of tell his story to the world. He's now, you know, in his 80s or something. He's an old, old guy. And uh, studio audience, they're telling this very moving story. And near the end, they say, hey, Nicholas, we have a surprise. This woman you've been sitting next to is this one of the childs that you saved. She gets to turn to him and, you know, they have a very touching moment. Um, and this is where, like, there's not a dry eye in the house where the speaker says, hey, if there's anybody else here that's been impacted by the efforts of this man, please stand up. And the whole audience stands up and he gets to see for the first time all these people who, you know, lives he changed. He literally saved all these people. All the letters. Back here is the list of all the children. This is Vera Diamant, now Vera Gissing. We did find her name on his list. Vera Gissing is with us here tonight. Hello, Vera. And uh, I should tell you that you are actually sitting next to Nicholas Winton. <laughs> and it was just so wonderful, so terribly, terribly touching. Can I ask, is there anyone in our audience tonight who owes their life to Nicholas Winton. If so, could you stand up, please? Uh, so anyway, you can tell I can hardly talk about this without getting a little, you know, <laughs> tightening in my throat, but it's it's such a great story. And, uh, you know, I think it sort of embodies what we try to keep in mind during things like Memorial Day. Uh, it shows that you don't necessarily have to be a soldier to serve. There's many different ways to make a difference. Uh, but also, like I said, it really shows the power of one. It was a person who was, you know, in a place where he said, look, you know, Something right isn't going on. I've got some agency to make this better. And he did. And he ended up making a you know, tremendous difference in the world. So anyway, she knew about this guy already. Love yeah, to hear no, your thoughts, Jeff, about the story. No, no, they, they made a, there's a movie. I, th I think the name of it is uh, The Man Who Saves Children from the Nazis. I think it's the name of it. But they made a movie about it and a BBB special. And uh, the, the interesting thing is the guy was a stockbroker in London. 
Yeah, so, yeah, he yeah. became a stockbroker. Yeah. yeah, and died finally at 106. So he lived a very long, happy life. And and uh, but you know, it's important. You know, it's you know, it's stories like this. You know, you know, you and I have talked about the Titler cycle uh, before. Um, you know, which talks about the evolution of society and. We're clearly in that apathy and, and you know, selfishness phase of that cycle. And what's important about these stories and thinking about Memorial Day and, and the importance of these things is that if you take a look at what's going on in, in society today, this whole left right divide and, you know, uh, this group wants these rights and somebody over here wants this right. It's very selfish, very, it's all of it's very selfish and very narcissistic. It's all about me and what I want. And I don't care what you want. And I don't care if it makes the world a worse place as long as I get my way. You know, that's not the way society works. That's not the way society should work. It's not healthy for society. It's not good for the economy. And, but, you know, this is, this is just the part that we've, you know, that we've moved to. So, you know, it's very important that, you know, we, you know, look at people like Nicholas and, and others and, and and say, you know, what is it that made these people stand out? And if we had more people like that working in the world today, the world would be a much better place. Yeah. And I, and I totally agree. It's sort of why I share the story. But I, I think a great question or I, th- I think a great point is that anybody can step into that. Right. Anybody has the potential to do that. And, uh, you know, that's maybe just a question, you know, more of us should ask ourselves more often, right? Which is, hey, given, well, given where I am today, uniquely, what can I do here uh, to, to potentially make a better impact uh, than, than what I'm currently doing? And, and obviously, you know, he was in a very historically, you know, uh, extreme situation. And those don't come along every day. In many cases, we're thankful for that. But, you know, um, you know, another question is just sort of, hey, mentally, am I, am I prepared that if if history calls, you know, w- w- will I step up and meet it? I don't know. But these are the kind of things that I think more of us, to your point, you know, yeah. should be spending a little bit more time thinking of, um, maybe more so than the, you know, watching the next TikTok video. Look, you don't even have to to try to go figure out how to save, you know, 500 kids from some terrible thing. You know, one of the best things you can do in your life, and I've done this before, and it's, uh, in fact, one of the persons that I did this with now works for us, um, but be a mentor, right? Just yeah. go find somebody that you can be a mentor to um, or open yourself up to be a mentor, uh, join big brothers and sisters organization, something like that. You can change people's lives. And maybe it's just one person, but that's all it takes. Because if you change one person's life, they're going to change a million others. So, you know, just we all have the ability to do stuff like that and 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 to to do good in the world. You don't have to go do it on the Nicholas Wynn scale, right? And and do this phenomenal thing that will be remembered in history. All you gotta do is help one person. If you help one person, that'll change the world. All right. Well, well totally agree. And, and again, sort of what part of this up is, you know, I, I find that things like Memorial Day and Veterans Day. For folks like me who did not serve, right? There's this sense of sort of like I'm super appreciative, but hey, what can I do? I, I missed my window. I, I didn't serve, right? There are all sorts of ways to be in service, like you're saying, and still make that difference. And that's maybe how we can, you know, that's the responsibility that we can put on ourselves to honor those folks that came before us to say, okay, look, I'm going to up my game a little bit and, and do what I can, right? Yeah. All so right. Maybe, with- maybe, maybe, maybe the way we should start a group here. And we'll go find people on the internet, like on TikTok. And we'll, if you can help one stupid person today, that will change the world. So maybe that's, you know, it's like one of those, uh, you know, send $5 over to save a child, you know, adopt a child over in some other country. We'll have to do that. We're going to adopt a child on the internet. Oh my God, Lance, you Keep know, them. we're going to get a ton of suggestions in the comment section below for ideas on this. Hey, uh, but I'm, folks, I'm if you have them, throw them in there. We'll read hey, them. Yeah, throw them in the pool. We're open to, we're going to start an organization that does to, to solve the world. All right, folks. Um, well, look, in, in wrapping up here, um, I want to give uh, just a quick heads up. Lance, you're going to be learning this in real time as I'm sharing it. Um, Wealthy on holds two conferences every year. Um, we did a phenomenal uh, conference in the spring back in March. Lance was part of it. Um, we just picked a date for the conference, uh, for our fall conference. And uh, let me just make sure folks have got the right date here. It's going to be Saturday, October 21st. I'm giving you a way advanced notice. Mark your calendars as we get closer, you know, near the end of the summer. Um, I'll start, you know, letting you know how you can go register for it and learn more about it and all that. Uh, we already have a pretty good lineup that's beginning to form for it. 
Uh, I do want to just share that uh, Lacey Hunt has kindly agreed yet again to be our kickoff uh, keynote presenter there. If you have watched previous uh, conferences that we've done, you know how unbelievably valuable uh, Lacey's presentations are. Um, he spends like a whole month preparing them. Um, just graduate level walk through uh, charts from one of the greatest living uh, economists uh, in the country. Um, so anyways, uh, if that teaser, um, let that teaser sit around in your brain, like I said, as we get closer to the end of the summer, I'll start sharing more details on that. Um, all right, folks. Well, look, um, we're wrapping up here, Lance. Just want to remind everybody who's still watching here that um, for all the reasons we talked about, and many we didn't, uh, this is a really challenging time for most average people to navigate these markets. And that's you know the huge reason why we recommend that most people work with a good professional financial advisor, but not just any financial advisor, You know, one that takes into account all the macro issues that we talk about on this channel here. Uh, if you've got a good one who can do that, um, create a personalized portfolio plan for you and then execute that plan for you. And the execution is the key part. And Lance and I talked a little bit about this earlier. Um, great, you should stick with them. But if you don't, or if you like a second opinion of, of one who does, maybe even Lance and his team there at Real Investment Advice, uh, just request a free consultation with the financial advisors that Wealthion endorses. To do so, just go to Wealthion.com, fill out the short form there, schedule your consultation. And reminder, these things are free. There's no commitment to work with these guys. It's just a public service they offer to help as many people as they can. Um, all right, Lance. Um, thanks so much, buddy. It's always great talking to you. These, uh, you know, these videos every week, folks. Uh, if you enjoy these videos, would like to see Lance and I continue to do this. He actually asked the question. I couldn't believe you said if we are going to be doing this in 2025. Like, what do you mean if? Of course. I mean, well, you should if, be like, we're going to be doing this. Like they, if they stop listening, I mean, hey, whatever. <laughs> Uh, but folks, if you want I to see this, continue, yeah, all the way to mayor, perhaps to 2045, do us a favor, support this channel by hitting the like button, then clicking on the red subscribe button below, as well as that little bell icon right next to it. Um, and folks, we just passed 275,000 subscribers. We are beginning to zero in on 300,000 subscribers on this channel. If you watch this video, if you like the videos we have on this channel, but you're not yet subscribed, please hit it to try to head us, help us get to that 300,000 level. Um, Buddy Lance, it's been great. Any parting bits of advice here for folks as they go off to enjoy the weekend? Uh, have a great weekend and we'll see you back here next week. All right. Thanks so much, buddy. Everybody else, thanks so much for watching.